Well, thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you, Professor Kim. I have only a few words in order to start this lecture and dialogue, uh, or better, a polylogue. That's, in fact, the, the word we could use because uh, our research group on intercultural philosophy wanted to center the idea of a possible circularity of knowledge and, and research uh, in a plurality of philosophical traditions and thoughts uh, using the term polylogue in order to widen up the notion of dialogue um, that is composed not only <clears throat> by two people or two traditions, but something that encompasses and, and widens the possibility of understanding, of mutual understanding. And the opportunity is particularly happy because uh, the title of Professor Kim's book, The Center is Everywhere, is uh, quite uh, coincident with the name of our group, uh, Mushin En. In Japanese, the idea is a circle without the center. Um, of course, uh, there is also a sort of um, allusion to the Mushin of Zen Buddhism, so the possibility to overgo the rational knowledge, the rational uh, mm, form of argumentation via argumentation itself. We do not intend to go towards some intuitional and insightful possibility to understand the world, we are philosophers, we are interested in linguistics, in uh, translation studies, in anthropology, but uh, the idea is that uh, the so-called Western categories or Western forms of rationality are not the only one, of course, and uh, they can't presuppose to be immediately universal. So universality can be something to be conquered, to be acquired together. And uh, so it's a particularly fruitful occasion today to speak with Professor Kim. We want to thank him. And uh, I think that we can enhance our, our discourses and our possibility to share this kind of uh, intertwining or intercultural uh, thought. The dialogue between Christianity and Buddhism, or Christianity, science, uh, and modern time is particularly important because uh, there are some world views that shapes our modern and contemporary world. Sometimes they collide, they collapse. Sometimes they can be enhanced or um, also forecast together. So the idea is uh, uh, to foster the possibility of a mutual understanding. So thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Professor Kim. Now it's up to you. Hello, everyone in Japan and also in Europe. So first, I sincerely, sincerely appreciate my colleague, Eleni Kumbay and other people in this institute. And also Gunti Mushinen uh, of preparing and inviting me to this beautiful meeting to give you my to a little book. And I also thank all of you for participating in this meeting. I want to welcome all of you. So it's for me a great a honor and a pleasure to talk about my own book and to have a chance to have opportunity to get a, your critical opinions then which I can I think, I hope I can go further, one step further. So the sentence everywhere, uh, the title was actually comes from the old, the, the medieval uh, Christian uh, traditions, the uh, God is the, is someone whose center is everywhere. So this book was a small attempt of theology to, for me to do this task of hermeneutical work that means to understand the Christian message in the situation in which it finds itself. So I want to begin uh, my talk uh, from a quotation from the first epistle of Peter in the New Testament. Uh, uh, can you go to the uh, four, number four? I'm sorry, I, my computer doesn't work very well, so, so thank you. 
So the first epistle of Peter in the New Testament is well cited as demonstrating the task of theology in every age. It says, quote, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So in this, I am persuaded by what I thought he was my doctor father in my university in Basel in Switzerland. I mean, what a systematic theologian, he said on the theological task based on this biblical crisis. So I would more cite it uh, when I say this quote, the idea of answering deepens our understanding of the inherent, inherent uh, historicity of theology. We do not have to answer every question posed at each moment of every age. If questions have their own historicity, so does the accountability of theology. There are times in history when specific questions become topical, he used it in a German word, actual, and specific answers that had not been available before become possible. Therefore, as human beings confined by history and the finitude of life, theologians can only be responsible and accountable for what happens within their history. So as he ought to maintain, there are specific questions in our age that theology should answer. And I have a question from the Buddhist thought and natural science as the specific and actual topics. And I think it's the most urgent questions. By doing so, I believe, I hope I undertake the historical task of theology. Can you go to the seven, please? Okay, I think it is one of the symptoms of our age that such such a critical questions. I mean, the question from the religion and the question from the science. Such critical questions and prophetic voices come not from the theologians working inside their disciplines, but from scientists outside the Christian. Karl Fritz von Weizsäcker, the German physicist, philosopher, and theologian in a unique sense, was one of those natural scientists who sincerely raised theological questions. I quote, what will our theology look like if we try to remain honest to history and at the same time honest to nature? Moreover, at what point do we need to sacrifice our pride in that honesty for the sake of a greater experience? So I think I accept his question as a question, what can theology sacrifice? to answer the question that was raised by uh, from this uh, religion and science. And it such an answer, the task of answering, that will lead us to a greater experience. So accepting von Weizsäcker's question, I think we can raise two theses as follows. Please go to the next eight. The first thesis, my thesis is this. The dialogue with Buddhism and natural science deprives the Christian faith in the traditional form of its foundation, and that in a thorough way. I will add a word called that my reality experience of theology. The second thesis is this. By overcoming this my reality experience, the Christians, we could get a new self-understanding of the Christian faith. So this is two theses I want to, to deal with, and I want to uh, take uh, give the answers. First one is the nihility experience of theology in the face of religion and natural science. The, more, the most urgent task of theology today is, I think, to conduct a dialogue with the various religious traditions of humanity and also natural science. However, as we encounter religion and science, we will soon encounter a complex problem. The more we take this encounter seriously, the deeper we will learn that the traditional self-understanding of the Christian faith is going into the abyss. On the one hand, the history of religions asks the Christian faith to admit that Christianity is one religion among many religions, not only in historical phenomena, but also in the genuine Christian sense of faith. Christians are demanded to reconsider the traditional assertion of the exclusive absoluteness of Christianity for the redemption of the whole world in its core, including the meaning of redemption in the Christological and ecclesiological sense. 
On the other hand, the modern natural science, especially the biological sciences, such as the social biology, neuroscience, and cognitive psychology, they just rooted in the Darwinian evolution. They assert that all religious phenomena, of course, including Christianity, all religious phenomena are nothing but the byproducts of natural evolution. These biologists insist that the biological disciplines can explain all religious phenomena without relying on religious, so-called religious hypothesis, such as the transcendental or the ethical. Of course, they do not deny that humans have a religious aspect that make them different from other animals, but they believe the biological principle could explain it thoroughly. So as much as history relativized the claims of absoluteness of Christian faith, the nature, the category of nature seems to deprive the religions of their traditional basis, of course, including Christian faith. In this end, in this and that way, in this and that way, religion and natural science shake the ground of Christian faith in its traditional form and ultimately plunge the foundation of Christian faith into the abyss of nothingness. This experience resembles an existential nothingness experience because the Christian faith offers Christians the ground to understand themselves and the world. And it is just that ground that religion and natural science deprives. So the more seriously we conduct the dialogue with the religion and science, the deeper we will experience that the traditional self-understanding of Christian faith is no longer possible. Moreover, our need becomes even more profound because we cannot and must not stop this dialogue because theology is in its essence a hermeneutical attempt at the self-understanding of the Christian faith and it is precisely religion and natural science that constitute the, and the decisive and indispensable hermeneutical solution for the self-understanding of theology in our time. <clears throat> Therefore, if we want to remain faithful to the task of theology, we have no other way to carry out the dialogue with religion and natural science. And how can we overcome this dilemma? Here, I'd like to refer to an appeal by Jinul on the path of enlightenment, which was the next night. Jinul was a Zen master, the Korean Zen master in the 12th century in the Korea, uh, Korea, dynasty, Korea dynasty. But he said this, a person who falls to the ground because of the ground gets back up by using that ground. To try to get up without relying on that ground would be impossible. So this Zen master, I think this Zen master teaches us because of religion and natural science, Christian theology falls to the ground. However, religion and natural science are the hermeneutic horizons on which theology understands itself. Thus, Theology remains faithful to its task. If so, there's no other way for theology than to rely on religion and natural science to understand itself, although well, precisely because religion and natural science make the Christian faith fall. Religion and natural science make the self-understanding of the Christian faith possible and simultaneously impossible. So I repeat once again, religion and natural science deprive the Christian faith of its reason. We have called it the naivety experience of theology. Nevertheless, faith can overcome this naivety experience only if we rely on religion and natural science. Overcoming the naivety means neither returning, empowering, but hitting it from the front, from the front and breaking through it. In the sense that the naivety experience deprives a religious existence of its foundation of being from the very inside of and on the, on the foot, the religious existence, and at the same time allows that religious existence to be reborn as a true self, the Christian faith's experience of naivety by encountering religious science is to be accepted positively as a chaotic and revelatory moment through which Christians enlighten to their true self. So the question is how to break through this naivety experience. To overcome and break through the naivety experience mentioned above, 
I would like to turn to the Buddhist philosopher Soth of Keiji Nishitani. So I want today to well, learn very much from you on this philosophy of Keiji Nishitani. All of you are experts on Keiji Nishitani, and I am, my work is a small interpretation of him. So please give me your uh, critical and uh, creative opinions. Nishitani's philosophical thought was formed and deepened by reading the German theology and philosophy of Meister Eckhart, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Martin Heidegger, and so on. In this sense, we can understand why Nishitani understands himself as becoming and already become a Buddhist. In German, it's said, Ein Berden Geborgen of Buddhist. And at the same time, he calls himself becoming, but not yet become a Christian. Ein Berden nicht geborgen of Christ. Also, in the same sense, we can say that Nishitani's attempt could be a mirror for us to reflect upon. We Christians are now trying to understand ourselves through encounters with Buddhism and natural science. And I think that was just what Nishitani has done from his Buddhist standpoint. From our point of view, Nishitani's confrontation with Nietzsche's nihilism and the Christian mysticism of Christ Eckhart has a crucial significance. Nishitani had understood these two great thinkers in a Buddhist way and thus, Nishtani figured out a way to overcome his essential experience of nihility. Moreover, this is also what we Christians want to do in the face of religion and natural science from the Christian perspective. Next, please. Nishtani said in an interview that the experience of nihility has been the starting point of his philosophy. His nihility experience was not only an academic theme that appears in the history of thought in the West and East, but also a deep sense of deep sense and existential awareness that the ground on which he stood was withdrawn beneath his feet. This experience was for Nishtani, this experience was a starting point of his philosophical thinking, as he said in an interview. I quote, I felt very strange. I felt as if I were dangling in the air. The best way I can put it is that my feet were not planted firmly on the ground. The soles of my feet were not touching the ground. There was a gap. In German, there was a, there is a Tom Schweben, which means unsteady, with no place to rest. It was kind of like floating. So this sense of floating was more deeply informed by his informed by his reading of Nietzsche's European atheism and the Christian mysticism of Meister Eckhart. By reading Nietzsche and Eckhart from the perspective of Jain Buddhism, he started believe that the nihility paradoxically would illuminate the ground of his true self. The following two quotes shows us how Nishitani wanted to take Nietzsche and Eckhart from his Zen Buddhist perspectives. Next one, please. The, the one, the one. No, 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 no. The previous one. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so this is on Nietzsche. God is that can be understood in this sense. It opens an abyss within life before which you can no longer say that we live in the presence of God or the love of God, that we are dead out to ourselves and living in God, that we live in union with God, and so forth. And later on, my second card, next please. The ground of God is the ground of the self, and the ground of the self is the ground of God. It is a self that attains complete freedom and transcendental religious insight. In other words, when this medieval German mystic speak of a Brooks breakthrough, the rich book, he expresses an elemental subjectivity that transcends the idea of God opposed to the self in the personal sense, and thus arrives at his own self-awareness. God destroys the form of the self, and the self destroys the image of God. Nietzsche's proclamation of God is death and Eckhart's insight into the soul's breakthrough to the Godhead had given Nishtani the active motive to accept, accept his nihilist experience as a moment for overcoming nihilism. From this, next please, from this arises the peculiarity of Nishtani's way of thinking, which means accepting nihility as that which totally denied its existence while giving back to it the real reason for existence means a radical subjectivization of nihility. I quote Nishtan's words again. 
We note that in our day, the, this awareness has reached its culmination in the subjectivization of atheism. In other words, the nihility that spares the death of God emerges from deep beneath the material, mechanical world and is perceived by modern man as an abyss in which he experiences the ex ecstatic transcendence of his self being. Only when a man has felt such an abyss open at the ground of his existence does, this, does his subjectivity become sub subjectivity in the true sense of the word. Only then does he awaken to himself as truly free and independent. Modern nihilism emerged from the influence of modern science, which is deconstructed traditional religious and ethical values. Ethical values. From these intellectual historical phenomena, Nistani sees that the scientific explanation of the world is deeply concerned with man's existential self-understanding. Nistani argues that the modern natural science is not a dead end for religion, but a creative start, start, starting point for a new self-understanding of religion. For that, we have to take the question natural science brought to us not as something objective, but as existential. I quote once again uh, Listani, next please. For a thinker who faces science existentially, that is, who accepts it as a problem for its existence as such, that the user state of the universe is explained by science in terms of lifeless material, materiality, means that the universe is a field of existential death for himself and all humankind. If the world is a material and lifeless world of death, then we human beings, as a part of that natural world, will recognize that our life is already and always permeated by death. In this sense, nihilism, which has emerged from the influence of modern natural science, offers us a but somewhat different point of view than the, end, than the one that has been common until now, and from which one can understand the relationship between science and religion in a new way. Next, please. I'm convinced that the problem of nihilism lies at the root of the mutual aversion between religion and science. And it is here that my philosophical engagement found its starting point and from which my preoccupation within nihilism grew larger until it enveloped almost everything. This is a somewhat different viewpoint from the hitherto usual one about the relationship between religion and science. Nishtani wanted to deal with the problem of religion and science as a question of a modern man's consciousness of his own subjectivity. Nihilism has revealed to us that religion has so far tended only to seriality exclusively from the aspect of life made possible by the personal relationship between God and man. On the contrary, natural science sees the whole reality from the perspective of lifeless, perspective of lifeless matter, that is, from the point of view of death. In the scientifically understood world, only the cold natural law, totally indifferent to human destiny, dominates. However, if religion and science offer us two fundamental ways of understanding ourselves, then we must say, we must recognize that these two sides intersect deeply in the core of our existence. The world of death cuts across the world of life, and the world of life stands straight because of the world of death. Reality reveals itself to us as double exposure, in which life and death are superimposed on each other. The same applies to the relationship between religion and science, being and non-being, spirit and matter, personality and personality, in, and impersonality, as the study says, next one, things. This kind of double exposure is the true vision of reality. Reality itself requires it. Reality eludes all such attempts at reduction. In the same sense, the aspect of life or aspect of this are equally real. And reality is that which appears now as life and now as this. It is both life and death, and at the same time, it is neither life nor life nor death. This is what we have to call the non-duality of life and death. I will digress a bit here and share uh, my little experience with you. 
Next, please. Uh, 18, please. One more. Okay, thank you. When I visit the city of Hildesheim in Germany for a conference about, I think it was about eight, uh, nine years ago, I could see the coffin of Bishop Bervard of Hildesheim in St. Michael's Church. There I could read the writing of the high grave cover plate for him, which reads like this. I was part of humanity very hard. Now I lie past in this terrible coffin, worthless and look as ashes. Woe is me that I have not led my high office well. Merciful peace be granted to my soul and you sing your amen. I also read that it was when the bishop was still alive that he made men write this. That means the bishop was already clearly conscious of his death in his lifetime. However, this consciousness of death is not separated from his faith in the resurrection of eternal life. We lead, this, his, we lead his deep faith in eternal life in the description of his sarcophagus. Next time, please. Bernward, a bishop, servant of the servants of Christ. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that on that last day, I shall rise from the earth and I shall again be closest with my skin and in my flesh, I shall see God my Savior. I myself shall see him and my eyes shall behold him and no one else. My hope is kept in my breast. When I read these phrases, I remembered what Nishtani said about double exposure. I'm afraid, of course, that I misunderstood both of them. Nevertheless, at least for me, what I had seen in Hildesheim was an illumination of the simultaneity of life and death. Furthermore, if it is an enlightenment of the simultaneity of life and death, then time does not matter, I think. Whether the enlightenment means eternal life in the future, or whether the enlightenment means the birth of the true self here and now. As the Gospel of John in the New Testament says, the believer has already eternal life and is already moved from death to life. So I want to go back to Nishtani. The double exposure of religion and natural science shows us that life and death crucify each other in our reality. Both contradictory things work in and through us. How are we to understand these things? Nishtani thinks we can understand this thing from the standpoint of Sunyata. Next one, please. In Buddhism, you know very well, so. especially Mahayana Buddhism, the term Sunyata represent, represents the fundamental Buddhist insight. Sunyata is a trans, translated as the word impotence or boldness. It is another term for the same Buddhist insight of arising independence, Pratitya Samuppada. Everything exists in mutual and interdependent relationships. Accordingly, individual things have no unchanging substance or self-nature within them, within them. Precisely because of this lack of self-nature, things can exist in interdependence. Nagarjuna, the founder of the doctrine of impotence, has put this method thus. We state that whatever is dependently arising, that is impotence. That is dependent upon convention. That itself is the middle path. From this, it can be said that the Buddhist viewpoint of emptiness is a unique way of a transcendence that allows nihilism to be overcome. So this study. In the teaching of Sunyata, the nihility can be overcome precisely through its innate dynamics. If we take this nihility into it, into it as the ground of our subject, if we dwell in the Sunyata standpoint, we can break open the solid shell of our subject that we usually hold and cling to as our determined self. From the standpoint of Sunyata, this subject will break open from within. In the dialogue with religion and science, the same effect of nihility experience emerges from the encounter with religion and science, the Christian faith. From the point of view of Sunyata, we realize that religion and natural science are not the others existing outside the Christian faith, but the internal others constructing the Christian faith. In other words, our Christian faith is formed from the beginning through dialogue with religion and natural science, so it is no longer possible to separate religion and science from our Christian faith. This fact coincides with the hermeneutical awareness that 
the Christian faith is already and always constituted by encountering religion and science. By this way, I think the Christianity centric subject consciousness is overcome. It is also fascinating that in this context, the Nishtani thinks he can lead from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount the non duality of life and death, the double exposure of life and death, of the love of God that gives us life, and the all controlling lifeless law of nature. Next up, please. In this Sermon on the Mount, Nishtani reads of the indifferent of indifference of love of God and also the indifference of nature. God makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This then adds quite further. The indifference of nature reduces everything to the level of a highest abstract common denominator, be it matter or some particular physical element. In contrast, the indifference of love, love of God, embraces all things in their most concrete form. For example, good man and evil man and accepts the differences for what they are. In the first, the indifference of the love of God is a reverse side of the indifference of nature. We must say that God as ultimate reality cannot be grasped by the dichotomy of the personal and the impersonal. It means that the personal as the ground of God's love is deepened into the even more primordial ground. Istani calls this the absolute nothingness, whereby the negation of a person's centeredness means an existential self-negation of the person of a man, which I believe is standing wrong from Meister Eckhart's concept of the breakthrough. The Christian faith confesses that we are redeemed and live by the indifferent love of God, the love of God that forgives us despite our sins. If the love of God were not indifferent but different, differential, then the sinner could not be forgiven eternally. At the same time, we know well enough that indifferent love of nature governs us all. All of us, the wicked and the good, all creatures are together subject under the indifferent law of nature, working to human desire and longing and fearing. The interpenetrating integration of the indifference of God's law and the indifference of natural law leads us to the eccentricity of ourselves. The solid shell of our closed face consciousness is broken and we enter into openness. Such an opening always happens negatively and works positively. The insight into the indifference of God's law leads us to a total and radical self-negation because the all-embracing love of God does not express an objective and self-evident fact, but demands an existential confession of our sin. This confession also embraces an abandonment of the exclusivity consciousness that only we are redeemed by God. Thus, all-embracing indifferent love is revealed by the fact that even I, the worst sinner among all sinners, that is the caught from the first piece of Timothy about. And I, even the worst sinner among all sinners, are being loved by God. The indifference of natural law also deconstructs our egocentric subjectivity consciousness, for we all love, as Paul has said in the Epistle to Romans, in chapter 8, verses 82 to 23, that all creature longs with us and still fears. But not only they, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, long even with ourselves for adoption, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. So I want to close my talk with a few words. <clears throat> By trying to understand God from the standpoint of Shunyata, we have found a new, I think we have found a way to understand the unity of the indifferent love of God with the indifferent love of nature and to confess God as a personal, impersonal, impersonal, personal reality. We are living now relying on this reality of indifferent love and it is none other than this reality of indifference that we will return to. This reality, which we believe in having found anew through the dialogue of Buddhism and natural science, however, 
It reflects the insight in the ancient confession about the reality of God as the eternal mystery. The next one, please. The unspeakable mystery of God, I mean, which embraces in itself life and death, speech and silence, personal and impersonal, spirit and matter, all together, as Paul Tillich, the, the famous theological mind in the 20th century, ended his masterpiece, Systematic Theology, with the following sentences. I quote, Often a prayer which starts with the addressing itself to God as Lord or Father moves over into a contemplation of the mystery of the divine ground. Divine ground. Conversely, a meditation about the divine mystery may end in a prayer to God as Lord or Father. Thank you for watching. Right, Professor Keith. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, now, normally, thank you for, for your lecture, Professor Kim. We are very thankful. And as usual, we can start with some questions or, or some hints for a discussion. I have noticed some ideas, but uh, I don't want to be the first to, to intervene. If there is someone who wants to ask a question or to add something, please feel free to raise your hand in the virtual mode or, or in your bodily dimension, and we, we can go on. Raquel, I see that you raised your hand. If you want ah, yes. And after Raquel G. I know. Okay. Raquel, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'll oh. speak. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kim Sensei. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> um, well, let me, okay. I read the, your book with great interest and I think it's a great book. I mostly agree with everything, at least with the main thesis. And I would like to raise at least two questions uh, that I ask myself as well. <laughs> um, the first is, um, whether you don't think that this kind of theology of pluralistic pluralism is not uh, easier to be adopted in a context of Asian Christianity uh, rather than in European, American, or maybe African Christianity. And I'm asking this because uh, Nishitani himself, uh, one of the authors inspiring uh, this view, argues that um, it is very difficult for a religion to change its ontology as it is for a fish, no, a fresh water fish uh, to change to salt water. And of course, uh, Nishitani and Buddhism are increasingly known in the West and Panikar is another example that this theology is possible, but um, still, um, and the um, conventional sense of identity and uh, personality, um, exclusivism, I think uh, still is going on uh, as concepts in mainstream uh, theology, uh, theology, as far as I can, I, can, uh, I know the uh, theological field, but it's not much. Well, this is my first question. <laughs> uh, second question has to do with the uh, Hawaiian Buddhism interpretation. And on the one hand, you mention a Kimura interpretation, and Kimura uh, considers Madhyamika to be nihilistic. And I think it admits another reading, uh, emptiness as relationality, uh, so to speak, um, following her sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So it's not necessarily, uh, I think, nihilistic. However, um, other authors, I'm thinking in Hashi Hisaki, for example, he points out that Hawaiian Buddhism emphasizes harmony 
and therefore equality and not much difference. And he argues that uh, Zen Buddhism uh, integrating by integrating negativity, uh, following precisely my amica thought, uh, manages to maintain both aspects, equality and difference, affirmation and negation. And I think this is what uh, Nishitani himself no, tries to do. So uh, with this account, I think it's possible uh, to um, for the tensions that emerge in this pluralistic view uh, to, to give an account of these um, tensions um, that disparate religious forms in the plurality and can manifest. So that's my question, <laughs> well, over two questions. Perhaps to Rob, <laughs> just um, please answer free, freely. <laughs> and I would like just to ask, what do you think about this? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Your question is very important and very challenging. And uh, the first question I listened today is the most difficult question to answer. So, so, so yes, I think we can call it that I want you to do in my book. We can call it is it Asian theology, maybe, or oh, not, not, not maybe. It's, it's Asian theological attempts. So, I think uh, I think it's very general. There's a no. My point is that there is no universal theology. So every theology has, is rooted in their own hermeneutical situations, it's historical and cultural and religious background. So uh, there's a European theology, there's a Spanish theology, there's an American theology, also there's Asian theology. And the, one of the characteristics of the so-called Asian theology is, I think, that the, 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 the so-called object of the dialogue, the religion, there are lots of religions, so it has to be one person to make dialogue with all religions. So I choose Buddhist, Buddhism because I don't know why, but Buddhism was a, a little bit near to me than Confucianism or Taoism. So, so it's also the, the coincidence. But I want to choose the Buddhism as the dialogue partner. And this dialogue partner is not outside me, outside my face. That was my starting point. So my Christian face is constituted, is being constituted by encountering with the Buddhism. So it is not, for example, a, if we yeah, the, the, the reading, then we should get the gods here. And a long time after, this gods becomes one of my, one, my, my body itself. It's not possible to take it out again. So I don't know whether it is, it is a good thing to do. But the Buddhism is part of my Christian face, or the latter, but through Buddhism, my Christian face was constituted, formed, shaped. So it's not possible to separate both of them. So I think it is one of the characteristics that we called of the, the, the theology that we call the Asian theology. So natural science too, we are in, living in our the modern society, the modern society, we are all baptized by the, the, science, the world view. So from our Christian faith, to se separate this science is not as surprising. So it is it, as, as if it is impossible to uh, separate the Judaic tradition from the Christian faith. I think it's the, almost the same thing. So in that sense, I think I, can say yes, it is Asian theology, attempted from the Asian theological aspect. And the second one you ask about this, the, the Madhya Mika and the Kimura called it a, a little bit nihilistic. Yes, I understand he, is, he tried to de de summarize the development of the Buddhist doctrine in three phases the, the, the early Buddhism and the Madhya Mika and the, the Fine Buddhism. I think it's, it's some kind of exaggeration, but through his the, the categorized understanding, I can learn the Mayada Mika, it emphasized the negative side. I think it's true. And finally, they try to emphasize the positive side. It's these two relationship between the Mayada Mika and Fayan is just like the, 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 the Sunyata and the Sampada Pratitida. These concepts are the two expression of the one and same reality, I think. So in that sense, the Kimura called uh, with some exaggeration, this, the Madhimika expresses the nihilistic tendency of Buddhism. So I can say, yes, it's true. And yes, it was a little bit the, 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 
too exaggerated. So I agree with your opinion in that sense. And and that was two, right? <laughs> there were two questions. I don't know whether my answer could be the answer to your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> I see Andrew's hand also. Oh, hi, thank you. Uh, Professor Kim, finally, we see face to face also online. Nice to meet you. And um, I have two questions. The first one is that uh, I wonder your thesis, uh, what are the advantages compared to other Christian contextual theology? Because like Kita Morikasa, for example, uh, his approach is much more conservative than you. In your thesis, you say we can negate everything, every truth in Christianity to enter nihility and then we break through the nihility. But other contextual theologians, like Kitamori, they say no, they must uphold certain essential doctrine or essential truth, like God must uh, be uh, incarnate, God must uh, have died on the cross and God had already resurrected. So Kitamori uphold these doctrines as a premises as a piece of positions and then start dialogue saying that okay uh, these buddhist concept or this shinto concept or this japanese literature concept can present our christian faith so what are your advantages compared to these conservative uh, methodology that's my first questions and my second question is that um, as a theologian having living in hong kong and uk i wonder how can we really encourage people to break through the nihility. Because from my practical experience, most Christians, not only in the West, but also in the East, especially in Hong Kong nowadays, they just stay in nihility. They negate all Christian faith because they encounter Buddhism or science, and then they don't have to break through. So I cannot, I don't, I cannot get uh, what is the, Point that we can go to a breakthrough in your presentation. Can you explain more? Thank you. Thank you so much. Your, your question was the, the what is my attempt is to stand with the, the so called conservative theorists, right? Mm. So then you mentioned about the, the crucifixion and the resurrection and these doctrines, right? So mm. I think. I must say I, I'm Christian, so I'm I'm also leading that tradition. But mm. I think we have to interpret that tradition in a modern way. So in this mm. sense, I was I think the Buddha was totally right. He said we should not we cannot abandon that tradition. We mm. interpret that tradition a new way. So that mm. was his motivation of his the, 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 the attempt of demissionalization. So nobody can deny that is uh, the, the development of the Christian doctrines. But the question is, the task is how we should and how we can interpret that in a way that we can understand it. So it depends on how we interpret the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure whether the conservative theologian, they, and I don't know whether how they interpret that, but at least the motivation of interpretation that is the key point of theology. The theology mm -hmm. is the, 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 the attempt to understand the Christian message in his or her own hermeneutical situations. So we cannot imitate the, the, what the, 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 all the, 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 the people said in our traditions. As the, the other, I, in that sense, I want to cite, I always cite the word from the, the Yaroslav Pelikan. He said, the traditionalism is the death face of the living, and tradition is the living face of the death. Death. Mm -hmm. So I think that's true, and I can want to learn from his what he said. That was the first answer. The second one is your question is how we can break through this nihility. Did I mm -hmm. understand right? Yeah. So according to Nishtani, uh, we so how can we break through? I understand this. Uh, we accept this nihility as my foundation. It is not outside of me. So nihility dwells in me. So I have to dwell in it. So in that process, maybe it's some, it's, 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 
can be a, some process meditation or some kind of existential enlightenment. Through that process, I can gradually accept this nihility as my own power, as my own foundation. So it is paradox, or it is the, the contradiction that nihility means there is nothing, but that nothing is my foundation. I think that cannot be explained very logically or ontologically, but I think that's the matter of some contemplation or some, how can I say this, uh, or living nice. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Professor Daisy. Um, yes, thank you. I, I have many questions, but <clears throat> let me begin at the very beginning. Um, theology has been shaken to its foundations by modern science and the claims and methods of modern science. Therefore, we need a dialogue between science and theology if theology is to survive. Uh, I wonder if there isn't a certain imbalance here because there's no call from scientists as scientists to dialogue with theology. So, I mean, you, you and I have both been to conferences where theologians and um, religionists, scholars of religion are theologians and, and scientists speak to each other. So when a scientist, a noted scientist, gets up and speaks, the theologians take notes and they clap and they ask questions and they're very animated. But when a theologian gets up to speak, the scientists fold their arms in boredom until, until it's over. We have the, um, you remember in the 1980s, there was a period of the Tao of physics, yeah. where you could find uh, physical ideas in Taoism. And there was the dancing ruling masters yeah. that found... Um, Girdle's ideas and so forth present. The Kupfer was one. I forget who wrote the other one. Uh, dancing ruling masters who found the ideas in Buddhism. This had a great impact on Buddhist studies and the Taoist studies, but it had no impact on the scientific world. It, it just went one way. So theology is shaken to its foundations. Um, science uh, apparently is not. And so if theology examines itself in the light of science, does science need to be challenged the same way by theology? Now, if you take this question, there's a way to avoid it. And that is to say, let's look at the subjective experiential aspects of the problem, which Nishtani deals with, right? And that these are only manageable. That's only can become a focus if you forget the claims that science made and challenge theology about. If you get rid of that, what, what it was that shook the foundations was not subject different views of subjective experience. It was something else. It was the, the truth claims. So the challenge to the foundations of theology are about fact claims about the world, not about the origins, development, and rationalization of subjective religious sentiments. Do you really think scientists would abandon their theoretical claims about religious truth on such a basis? Would any line of argument really shake science to its foundations? Or does science continue as before, excluding subjective experience from its method and its findings? Yeah, this is very, Sorry, very direct. No, no, it's a very complicated question. So I think, first of all, the, when the scientists wanted to explain what they do, what they research, then they have to use the, for example, philosophical language. Mm. When they began to use philosophical language, they began to think and they began to persuade theologians. Mm. If they use only this mathematics, then they are close in their own world. Mm. But when they try to make understand the other people's what they do, then they have to use the language that the mm -hmm. other people can understand. Then they can have to use philosophical or theological or literature language. So that's the question of this degrade, I see. The second one is- so, But then theology wouldn't be dialoguing with science. Mm -hmm. It will be dialoguing with what scientists do when they stop being scientists and start being human no, beings again. I, I, I do not think that they stop the science to work. For example, the uh, there's, uh, there's a phrases that I like most uh, from this, uh, this, this, this 
Alfred von Weizsäcker. He said in his lecture in Berlin uh, University, the, the history of science, history of nature, the concept of history of nature. He said, the human being and uh, the nature is older than human being. So human being is a part of this nature. Therefore, human being is also object of natural science. The natural science researched what nature is. But he said, human being is older than natural science. In that sense, the natural science is part of the human science. So this makes some circles, like some hermeneutical circles. Mm. So I don't know whether the science takes these phrases seriously, but there are some scientists who try to explain what they do. For example, Jacques Mono in his book of the chance and necessity, or this carefully to Isaac. They try to make understand the peoples, what they do. Mm. So not all scientists do that, I don't know. I think so. so it's very restricted. Some some scientists can, the theologian can make, not with all scientists dialogue. I, I know that, I admit that. Mm. So the question is whether we can find some places where this, the, if I can say, awakened scientists and awakened theology mm -hmm. can meet together. So do you think there is any existential, subjective, experiential problem in science? Yes, yes. That it could meet religion? They can make dialogues, at least. For example, Jack Mono, relying, relying upon his theory, right. he said the human being is something, someone who has no universal object in this yeah. universe, like, like that. So some kind of existential interpretation of his, 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 his biology. So, but not all science can do that, I see. But it's not, I, I don't know, I, I know it's not enough. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I was just going to uh, to compliment on something that Professor Heise was asking uh, or was commenting. I think maybe because the the scientist is coming from a specific religious background, mm. but no the, the, uh, theologist or uh, is coming from a specific scientific background. You, you know what I mean? So yes, right? No, I said no. <laughs> Um, because uh, so I, I think that may, maybe that, that's that that relates to what uh, Professor Heisinger was saying. That so um, most or many of the scientists uh, have already Sotsuyosa have already graduated from religion, right? And then they feel that they are uh, trying to find a real. Um, a shape of the natural world or something like that. And um, because they, they're coming from a, a specific religious background, right? While the scientist, um, while the, the theologian or the theologist is not coming from a, a specific scientific background and doesn't need to understand his own theology or his own religious worldview, <laughs> to using some of Nishida's uh, expression, uh, from a specific scientific background. Is it something like that? I see, yes, yes, and no. Okay. <laughs> because, because I can Thank imagine, you. for example, a theologian who didn't know anything about, for example, evolution theory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we all know what evolution theory is. Even though we do not know very completely, but we all know what evolution theory means and what it means to our being. So there's great differences. So we, the theologian, they also stand on one or several scientific mm -hmm. backgrounds. Mm -hmm. As you said, the scientists, they also stand on some specific, unique religious background. No, sure. I, I understand that, uh, uh, for example, the, the theory of um, evolution is something that is common sense, right? Oh, yes, yes. Or everybody knows from... Uh, from uh, elementary school or something, but but my 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 point is, I can understand why why the religious uh, or the theologists take notes when they go to a conference. Uh, they they take notes from the scientist because um, we we may not know the we may not know the intrinsic intrinsic. Uh, uh, 
things or aspects of a, a scientific theory, and then I can see why the, the theologian or the theologist would be interested in that. But when the, the theo theologist is speaking, for the scientist, it's just like more of that myth or something that he has been hearing since he was a, a child or something. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate here or anything like that, or, or not, not even trying to defend the scientist. I'm just saying that I, I, I kind of understand why the sci uh, what Professor Heising was saying, why the scientist doesn't take notes or doesn't feel the need to take notes when they go to a, a conference of religion and science. I understand because- as And I think the problem is, is in science. <laughs> right, I, I think science should be more open to the, the dialogue, like like you yes. were discussing. Then, I mean, this, this theological talk is boring. So, <laughs> I don't listen. Everyone doesn't want to listen to, but I know that's something. Except to me, but I think this also comes uh, really to what Raquel was saying that um, um, it's maybe I don't want to say it's easier, but it's maybe. Easier, okay. <laughs> for for an Asian from a Buddhist background to accept Christianity and to see Christianity from or, or to become a Christian from that Buddhist background, then for from for a Christian to become Buddhist without throwing out everything yes, yes, that yes, comes yes. from his Christian yes, background, yes, yes, right? Yes. So yes, right. So this is the ongoing process, right? Yeah. And when a theologian have a, the, the, they want to demythologize mm -hmm. their doctrines or their faith, then they want to listen what the science says. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. when the science want to listen to theologians, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. At what point do they want to take begin to take notes? I do not know yet. <laughs> thank you. Just thank you. Is that low? Is okay? Is that normal? Yes. Thank you. Just to intervene in this important and interesting discussion, I was wondering if uh, mm, much, if not all, depends on the paradigm shift, uh, if I can call it uh, this way, just like Thomas Kuhn uh, was talking about the scientific revolutions. I, I, I mean, in Middle Age, uh, probably it was up to the... Um, philosophy naturalis, the, the, philosoph the philosophers of nature, to uh, be subdued to, by, uh, by religion and to try to adapt their vision to the religious worldview. In my sense, now we are living in a different paradigm or using Panica's uh, jargon, we are living in a different myth. And now it's uh, uh, the opposite. The general paradigm or worldview is scientific, and it was philosophy or art or religion that has to be adapted, or maybe have a sort of complex of inferiority because uh, science is a uh, result as a sort of uh, uh, result oriented approach, we could say. And uh, philosophy, religion, seems to be um, a process-oriented uh, approach uh, in the sense that uh, they aim to a transformation of the self, whereas science uh, is uh, nowadays uh, more a sort of uh, ancilla technology. <laughs> it's a sort of uh, um, servant of the power of manipulating the world. So what I am saying is that maybe we are living in, in a different worldview, and that's one, at least one of the reasons why it's not uh, a symmetric dialogue, the dialogue in which we are trying to, to live. And I also wonder if uh, using different terms, just like faith and belief, I don't know if in Japanese we can translate like Shinko and Shinnen, maybe, but uh, in Western languages is quite strong, the difference, because belief uh, 
is something that is rooted in a set of dogmas, in a set of propositions, in a set of sentences accepted by community, whereas faith has no object. And when I have no object, but I have a sort of trust in an invisible dimension, it's difficult to translate this feeling, this emotion, this uh, existential way of behaving in something that is quantitative. And since science usually works with quantities, with measures, it's very hard to translate such a form of, of living. That's the reason why usually uh, religious statements or philosophical argumentations are relegated in a sort of literary and poetic world by scientists. I am generalizing maybe too much, but just to make the strong oppositions quite clear. Also, atheism maybe is uh, a figure of uh, Western globalization. I, I am wondering if uh, in Japan, Japanese Middle Age, uh, we could say that a person is atheist. I think it's another form of um, anthropological uh, growing of, of the categories of Western religion. So sometimes yeah, I, I think we have also to mind uh, the, the set in which we are talking and the, 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 the frame in which uh, our, our notions and categories uh, are to be translated. It was just a, a sort of an intervention, much more than a question, but I, I, I would like to know Professor Kim's opinion about uh, this shift of paradigm. Yes. Uh... I'm not sure whether uh, I can uh, directly uh, 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 respond to your uh, questions. It's very important and very difficult to. But uh, for me, at least, the science matters because science teaches theology or the religion that we are standing on a nothingness. I mean, nothingness in terms of understanding. So, for example, this the personal God or the Creator, uh, all of these uh, are the the the, the Byproduct of the, the for example, the, the modern the biology explains that they are the byproduct of this initiative, human evolution. So that teaches us, that makes us aware that the our the, the dogmas or our the language uh, must be demythologized and also then must be translated into this very uh, the how can I say the the uh, dry uh, scientific language. Uh, so. So we are standing on nothingness. That is something we can learn from the science. But the more important thing is that, that for example, the the the, the Whitehead, for example, he explained in his book the science and modern world. The modern science was born from the background of the Christian faith on in the personal God, because the personal God created the world. Not you know the chaotic way, but you know very rational way. The ratio, their face in ratio, that comes from this their face uh, in this uh, creator. So that, that means the Christian face itself includes the emergence of natural science. That means the Christian face has in itself some how can I say some the the the, the way to uh, way that leads us to this nothingness. So science and Christian faith is are in this sense not the two or the, the how can I say enemies, but Christian the, the Christianity includes in itself the, 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 the possibility of this science. So that means the personal God implies in itself this the nothingness. So I think that is very interesting for me, and at least there is. Why I have the interest in the science? Of course, the science, the concept of science, too wide. So the, the the physics, the biology, the, the geology, the, the too wide. So, but what I interest, what interests me is the, 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 the biology because they try to deconstruct the this the the, the, the the traditional religious concept. So yes, and it's in the sense, of course, we are. Uh, 
already a, a, on the track of the, the, the paradigm shift. It's, clear, it's, it's evident, I think. Uh, we cannot go back to this age where the, 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 the religion can control the science. No, it's impossible and not desirable. Uh, 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 I want to uh, stay on uh, Marcelo's hints. So why do you speak of science without speaking about techniques? Mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, because, for example, for Heidegger, the problem of nihilism, nihilism is related to the problem of technique. Mm -hmm not of science. So are for you science and the same things? So you don't need to make a difference? Why don't you mention things in your book? But if, if I could add one little note to this as part of the question, the science that you're talking about is what most hard scientists would call soft science science that kept one foot in philosophy, sociology, archaeology, psychology. Social Darwinism is of no concern to the physicist and the, and the molecular biologist or the, uh, you know, the person that works in, in brain science. It's, it's the soft science that's causing the, the threat to... Concerns yes. the principles yes. of that, yes, yes. So on the one hand, you've got technology, mm -hmm. which is a really, really good point, yeah. which is science is the servant of technology. On the other hand, you have um, the theology is kind of the servant to soft science when it's doing its dialogue. Yeah, yeah. The same yeah. sense, we can also say theology can be a servant of the politics, for example. Mm -hmm. There are lots of possibilities. So in this sense, I'm not sure whether this is the, the same a meaning, but Heidegger means technical and technology, but at least the, 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 the science and also theology, they can be also misused and used by the political or by ideologies. That's true, yes. <clears throat> so I see that Andrew. Uh, uh, can, I, can I join the conversation? I uh, uh, just want to continue the problem between science and uh, religion. I, because I see a danger here. Originally, Professor Kim's thesis is to uh, argue for the dialogue because we are living in an interface. Science, Buddhism, and Christianity are all parts of our life, ourselves, especially as East Asian Christians like us, like me. And that's uh, it's about necessity. I have to present Christianity, for example, in Confucian idea because that's my cultural element, that's part of me. But then now we enter into a, another discussion. In the case of science, it seems it's not the case. We have to engage science simply because they have the authority. They, we need to ask scientists for approval, to approve, to justify, okay, this uh, Christian concept, this doctrine makes sense. And if this is the case, I wonder whether it's still a dialogue. Because for me, it just feel like the Jesuits in 17th century when they arrived China, because they want to get approval from the Chinese literature, they have to say, okay, actually, God we, is equivalent to heaven in conversionism. That's not a sincere dialogue. They just want to justify their faith in this under this authority. And now the authority is no more Confucianism, but science. So uh, I wonder how we can distinguish uh, two things. Are we asking for approval only, or do we really acknowledge the interface and want to start that? Yes, I see. The dialogue with science it does not come from a need to make evidence or to prove that the theology is right. No. Yeah. As I said before, it, it, for me at least, the dialogue with science means because I want to demythologize my own Christian traditional faith. And through this demythologization or the, through this translation, I can, I think I can go the nearer to the traditional face. What tradition mm -hmm. teaches me uh, is the tradition asks me to de demythologize that tradition itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the way that we can deal with the tradition. 
So I do not want to make it prove that, for example, the, the Jesus was resurrected using the scientific mm. evidence. I want to uh, prove that he was resurrected. No, that, that's not what I wanted to do. I want to demythologize the, uh, the, the, the traditional, the, the, the Christian faith, the conscious, the pseudo science. So I'm not sure what you mean to this. I, I understand you are not proven, but mm -hmm. it seems that uh, now we enter to, into another atmosphere that we want to use some sensible language to present religions rather than uh, uh, it's just because uh, it's part of ourselves. So that's different. For example, uh, we, I'm, I'm not saying we prove God's existence, but uh, we engage a scientific dialogue or even dialogue with Buddhism because Japan is a Buddhist society. That's why uh, to convert other or to make sense of our religion, to tell other that our religions are sensible to this context. That's why we use this uh, concept. And that's a very uh, typical strategy of missionary in the past. And we won't call this dialogue. You see the difference, right? Those are conversion, those are evangelization, not really dialogue. Yes, yes, yes. So how can we distinguish or avoid going to that angle? So you mean that I use science to rectify Christian faith? Uh, yeah, uh, you can say so. I'm afraid that we go to science like Christian faith. Yeah. <laughs> that direction. I'm af I'm worried about that direction. Yeah. Mm. Maybe the contrast direction. I did. I, I using using the dialogue with science. I try to deconstruct the Christian traditional faith. So okay, uh, I do not want to ratify other the nationalized Christian faith. No. Mm. Okay. At least my intention was not that. Okay, yeah, I see. Mm. Thank you. The dialogue actually means that's, it's not a debate. So whether you are right it, or whether I'm it's, right. It's not, not, not a debate. I just clarify debate. because I know because Professor Kim, that's not your intention. But I worry that it will open to that direction. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe from a scientist. <laughs> yes. Maybe they can say so. Yes, yes, I understand. <laughs> okay, I understand. Okay. Probably uh, that was my impression when I read your book. It probably depends on uh, how deep the experience of nihility is for you as a theologian. So the discontinuity. In the tradition of the Christian uh, theology, uh, how how deep this this continuity yeah, is? is uh, existence. Yes, so. deep enough, probably. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. You can receive this kind of criticism. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, like like, like um, the the thought from the Bishop of Hildesheim. Yeah. Right? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very nice quote, but then I I, I was thinking like, uh, was his re was he really thinking about his own non existence or on his yeah. death, or was he just like expressing himself in face of death? You know, is he is he really confronting himself with nihility, or did he just say that because he was about to die or something? Mm -hmm. So I think so when yeah. I read you, uh -huh. for example, you quoted at the beginning Gadama. So probably it's the difference between Gadamer and Heidegger. Mm -hmm. So if you stay on the he uh, Gadamer side, there is a, a historical continuity mm -hmm. uh, in the hori 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 horizon fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, somehow the discontinuity is never so radical to restart completely the discourse. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Heideggerian uh -huh. nihilism mm -hmm. means that the experience of nihility Cut completely yeah. the history. But I think so. It depends. In God, we can also find this experience is creativity of the time. So the time itself has a creativity. So we cannot understand the past wholly. So I think God also noticed this discontinuity. Some, some. How can I say it? Desperation. We cannot understand past. So. 
so I see that so what the we got our loan from Heidegger this this discontinuity mm. this, 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 by descent. Yes, yes, yes. And, and your question is very important. How dearly I feel this the crisis of Christian faith. Yeah, yeah that's a good face. And so I think yes, whether I I was some academic interest as a mood, as a trend, or as I whether I really feel that crisis in my own face. Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah. Uh, and to go back to Marcello's question, I think that's really important. Let me, let me put it this way. What do you think science and religion, science and theology could talk about? Now here they're talking about why they need to talk to each other. Right? But what could they talk about? And the first thing you talk about is the, the fact that both of them are becoming servants of technology and of the economic system that supports technology and the effect it has on cultures and it, the effect it has on the scientific culture as well as the theological culture. That would be one thing to talk about. Are we in the middle of a shift that we're not talking to each other because we've both been swept up into something bigger? But are there other things you think? They, because, for example, you mentioned in your book about Dali and um, the sheep. Well, this is a big problem for theologians, but it's not really a problem for the scientists that are doing the owning. Yeah. yeah. What, so what would the... Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe we can we have to use the another language as a dialogue. Uh, the dialogue has... Is a, the, 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 we have a free understanding of what dialogue is. The two stand uh, each other and then they exchange their opinions. So maybe not dialogue. Or the, I can use dialogue in myself. So I try to understand my face using... Well, I don't know the using, but... Yes, through this scientific concept. So dialogue that is it happens in me, not out of my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this makes sense. So I, I used to term this the, the, the constitutive others. It's the, the other right, of course, but it constitutes myself. So it, I cannot separate it from myself. So yeah, I can see, I can see a scientist who feels the need for a religion. A scientist who feels the shukyoteki yoku. I can see that that dialogue would be is important for that scientist specifically inside of him, him or herself, right? Um, and I can see why religion would want to dialogue with science. But then I, once again, coming back to what we were discussing before, right? I can see why the science, science doesn't care about the, the discussion with yeah. religion, right? So, because last, uh, two, uh, 10 days ago, we had this discussion about science and uh, philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I can see why science is interested in dialoguing with philosophy and also because there is a lot of there's a lot of questions inside of science that, that philosophy may help to oh, yeah. explain and understand. But then when we are talking about religion, I can think about some... Can you give me some name of this scientist who has interest in religion and the philosophy? Uh, what was his name? Was his name? Who was presenting? The, 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 the name of the scientist. The Katsugawa Sensei. Ah, yeah, yeah. Katsugawa. The yes. Sensei. Last, last week. Yeah, yeah. two weeks, uh, 10 days ago, right? It's, it's like he's a scientist. He's a scientist. He's a physician. Yeah, physician, yeah. And uh, quantum physics or something yes. like that, right? Yeah. So... He he was really interested. He, he he actually he presented in our Ishida seminar. Ah yeah. So, uh -huh. Ah yeah yeah okay I heard it. Right? Yeah yes. <laughs> so that's it. You were so I was saying uh, you were here right? Yes I was. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay I'm not crazy so. <laughs> so maybe we have time for a last comment or a last question if someone wants to add some words. It's meant to open myself to understand the, <laughs> that fear beyond the movement. I think that the uh, best way to, uh, 
Well, it, I, I think they cannot lay set. We don't need to fight for Oh, not necessary. I'm listening to you. I open myself to understand the issues uh, that fear your movement, you know. I think this is the best way for me to contr contribute to the work carried out here and to receive from you the comments and suggestions that I need uh, in my research, which is my life. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm listening with very profound interest and admiration. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> So Marcelo, probably it's time. To yes, we are, we are perfect in perfectly in time, and uh, maybe we could go on uh, uh, for some more time. But uh, some of us has some other commitments and engagements. So thank you very much for this seminar. Thank you, Professor Kim. Thank you, Enrico, for organizing the seminar and to all the participants who came here. And so I hope we can go on and share new thoughts in other opportunities. Thank you, Jim, also for your constant presence. It is always a pleasure to, to see you and to hear your comments and your insightful ideas. Enrico, I, I give the word to you if you want to close and yeah, have a good dinner together this evening. Yes. Probably, yes. So thank you very much uh, for participating. And thank you to Professor Kim. Awesome. Thank you so much.